Associated Foundations Training Center aboard Battleship Iowa. It is another exciting episode of Scuttlebutt, the podcast of the National Museum of the Surface Navy. We're joined today by Carl Herzog, or I should say Dr. Carl Herzog, who is the historian for the USS Constitution Museum and has the distinction, um, I think it's a distinction, of uh, having been in the tall ships community, uh, and that's where Marianne and Carl met. Uh, around the room is the normal cast of characters. We have uh, Captain Roundup, and we have the nuts and bolts guy, we have the button pusher, uh, but I'll let everybody introduce themselves as we go around. My name's David Canfield. I'm the tech guy here. I'm the Vice President, Chief Information Officer for Battleship Iowa, and... I am Kyle Abbey. I am the Development Manager here aboard Battleship Iowa, fundraising for the National Museum. I'm Mike Getcher, Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer, and Chief Engineer for Battleship Iowa. And I had the honor to meet Carl back in March uh, in, in Boston there and, and walk the decks of the Constitution. So I'm very happy to be here and talk. And I'm Maren Fengler, and I am the producer in this room. And yeah, Carl and I go back a few years, and he lets me bug him with geeky Constitution questions all the time. So I thought we ought to just do it in front of everybody. <laughs> that sounds like a plan. I like bugging people with geeky <laughs> questions. Uh, as we were chatting earlier uh, about what we might cover in the podcast, uh, one of the things that we covered was uh, the changing technology and how technology changes across the years and certainly ship design changes, but the problems being solved really don't. And the one thing that came to mind for me was copper plating on the hull, which is there to protect against marine growth and shipworms. And uh, we have an impressed current cathodic protection system that protects against corrosion. Uh, but protection of the hull is a problem that hasn't changed because, uh, as it's been said, the sea doesn't change. Yeah, that's absolutely true, uh, and I think you're you know you're absolutely right. The challenges, regardless of time, uh, remain the same. We're still sailing the same oceans um, with you know with the same problems, uh, and certainly um, protection against marine growth and decay were you know have always been a constant, uh, and it is startling. Uh, from you know wooden ships to see just how significant it could have been and was in the days before uh, we really started adopting copper sheathing like Constitution has. I've actually read um, uh, accounts in depositions of commercial ships, small merchant ships uh, down in the Caribbean, uh, where the ship was in such bad shape that uh, when a chief mate went down below to find the the sound of the source of the trickling water leaking into the hull, he found it and went to stuff a piece of soft salted beef into the hole to plug it and instead managed to put his fist through the entire oh, hull God. of the vessel, um, leading the crew to have to, and this is on a really, you know, nice day sail from, um, uh, from St. Croix to, to St. Thomas and, and ended up having to beach the thing uh, in St. Thomas, which led to the insurance case that we read these depositions for. Um, and so, yeah, they, you know, it literally ate right through the hull. Um, and the technology was a significant upgrade, um, but it didn't come cheaply uh, at the time, or frankly, even today, uh, as I'm sure you can say for, you know, the more modern Navy. Uh, in our case, um, you know, rolled copper sheeting uh, when Constitution was initially built um, was not a technology that had really been become available in the U.S. yet. And so a lot of that copper was being uh, uh, overseas, you know, acquired. And then um, and then it was only later with um, uh, with the establishment of, of U.S. mills that were able to do that, that they you know quickly got into that within a pretty short amount of time. But again, like you say, you know, uh, copper has been a long time solution and is still, um, you know, reducingly incurred in a lot of like bottom paints and stuff. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's one great example, I think. Yeah. It's interesting too. I just thinking about the, your example from your deposition, um, you know, one of the, the battleships in the historic naval ships fleet did not enjoy the cathodic protection from its earliest uh, donation from the Navy all the way up through the eighties. And I've heard multiple uh, comments that there are areas of that steel hull, which you would not want to step on, you know, yes. and, and that's really true. I mean, um, and it, it's a huge challenge on a steel ship. It's just different. You know, it's the same idea, the same concepts. And I'm going to make sure and get a stock of salted beef here. So I have a yeah. solution. <laughs> something, <laughs> something to plug in. Yeah, the whole yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll be yeah. all over that. Trust right. me. A lot of bubble gum. Yeah. We can use that in the coffer <laughs> dam. Sure. And, and, yeah. and interestingly, and if Port Carl doesn't know all this stuff, but we're dealing with wind and water line uh, corrosion right now. We're doing coffer dam work. You know, to, to dry dock uh, the Constitution, it's amazing to me that you can actually go into one of the, the original dry dock in America. 
uh, and actually maintain her. And I, that's when I first saw her back in 95. Um, and, but in fact, she was in dry dock for that 95 to 97 refit. Um, on the Iowa, the only dry dock that I can get her into right now would be up in Portland. Um, and uh, that's a hell of a journey. It's, it's a six or seven day tow minimum. It's probably a $5 million tow, plus getting her across the bar and just getting her into the, uh, into the dry dock and then working on her um, for a number of weeks is, is a huge yeah. challenge. So, you know, these ships, both the Constitution even now, several hundred years later, and uh, the Iowa, we, we have similar challenges. Yeah, uh, those haul-out challenges are, are certainly, you know, not unique either um, and have been going on since the beginning as well, too. Uh, for USS Constitution, you know, the Navy hauled out uh, into that dry dock uh, the last time for uh, 2015 to 2017 for um, a, re a large recoppering of the bottom, actually, uh, as long as they're at the subject. Um, um, uh, pretty much the entire bottom hull, with, with a few exceptions, was was reco uh, recoppered. Um, but again, you know, getting in and out of there um, required the highest high tide available of the month. Yeah. Uh, and so, for, for as a Constitution uh, Museum and on the ship, that turned out to be um, to get out of of that dry dock in 2017 turned out to be at 11:30 on a, uh, at night. And so we had huge crowds of people in the middle of the night. Uh, waiting to see Constitution refloat, um, so it, it you know that the timing is is always difficult. The expense is always associated, and even when the ship was launched, uh, Constitution was launched right across from where she sits now in the Edmund Hart shipyard uh, in the old North End of Boston, and that launching was delayed by a month in 1797 because the the weight of that ship, the largest that they built there, uh, caused the waves to settle. Uh, in that shipyard while construction was underway. And so when they went to initially launch it uh, on a high tide in September, um, they were ready to go and it slid partly down the ways and came to a screeching halt. <laughs> and they tried a few things to get it going again with, uh, with no such luck and were forced to postpone what had been a, a highly planned ceremonial launch uh, to a month later for the next, uh, you know, high enough, high enough tide. Uh, and so she was launched on a pretty dismal, cold, cloudy day by all accounts in October with, uh, with a fraction of the population and, and none of the celebrity VIPs, uh, that had shown up and gone away disappointed in September. And that's so, a huge yeah, parallel. It, it, you know, it was <laughs> just problems with all this. <laughs> we have a parallel. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. We have a, we have a video on the day that Iowa did not leave Richmond, California to come to LA. <laughs> uh, oh, and, yeah. and it's like, you know, I think Mark Twain said, uh, uh, everybody talks about the weather. Nobody does anything about it for us. It was a weather delay. Um, oh, really? Yeah. It's kind of interesting. There is a shameless plug for uh, then Pacific Battleship Center and USS Iowa and my signature on one of those copper plates that went on there because I happened to be out there when they were just getting ready to haul her out. They had the plates in a museum and you could grab an engraver and sign them. Yeah, yeah we did. Nice. Yeah, we did. Uh, gosh, tons of those. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was thinking of Sassoon Bay and, and the two-day window to get her out of there. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know? and that's that's the one where uh, we had Jeremiah O'Brien come by and the band play. No, no, and no I was talking about like, leaving Sassoon. Oh, for, leaving oh, no. Sassoon. Yeah, because yeah. we had the, the, the tidal issues, too. Just getting her out of Sassoon Bay, Carl, you would know this, but the bathymetry was so tight that we yeah. literally had an inch or two underneath her. Um, and we'd even put 300 tons of water on her bow just to bring her, her rear end up a little bit to, to clear the, the mud and the silt. So, uh, which, once again... Which we almost did. I mean, what, what we didn't clear, we plowed through. So <laughs> Yeah, but it's amazing to think that nothing's changed in 250 years. I mean, we still have the same problems with the, the ocean, and the tidal issues are absolutely correct. No, and even at 11.30 at night on that high tide that I was mentioning for the launch in, uh, or the refloat in 2017, um, even with the ship, um, you know, really lightened up with, with no guns, no other ballast, uh, downrigged largely. Uh, the clearance uh, over that threshold over the gate was was 18 inches. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it was wow. still tight. Yeah, that's that's not where you want to be, especially with a priceless artifact like that. You know, One not... of the things that struck me when I was out there when she was being refitted um, was uh, the fact that I'm asked here all the time as a, as a battleship sailor that sailed on Iowa, they're like, oh, is this original? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, for, for what value of original? I served on her in the 80s. She was built in the 40s. She served in the 50s. Um, what are we talking about original? And I was walking around the Constitution. I was looking at what they, the work that was going on. 
ships are living, breathing things, right? Original is sort of a concept. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that is, a, needless to say, a, a constant source of debate, right? That's also the, the, the classic philosophical construct, right? That, that, you know, the idea of the ship of Theseus, this old, uh, you know, uh, Greek ship that had been turned into a museum for a thousand years and they slowly replaced every piece of it till it was a completely different ship. Was it still, in fact, the ship of, of Theseus? Was it the, you know, did it still constitute being the same object? Um, or the other great analogy I've always seen, you know, yep, the, the this axe has been in the family for yep. five generations. I was going to say hammer. the handle three times and, you know, replaced and the twice. handle four times. But gosh, it's the same old family axe. Um, yeah, that, it's a fascinating sort of, you know, philosophical construct. But Dave, you're absolutely right, you, you know, from the very beginning when you say, or, oh, how much of it's original no sooner was it in the water and and things are being replaced and changed and moved around and in constitution's case um you know even before first deployment some of that was occurring as they began sort of looking at how she was going to sail and and you know what was necessary and what kind of trim and draft and everything you know that that they wanted uh and you begin making those adjustments and and again certainly and i know this is true of steel as well too but certainly of a wooden ship of that time period the second that you are underway um, and and especially going into battle, you're beginning within months, you know, in the first year at looking at beginning to replace some of those pieces. And that is a constant on ongoing process. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, there is still a, a, a solid um, percentage in 10 to 15 uh, of ships timbers that are original to that 1797 launch on Constitution. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, stuff that swaps out uh, uh, on a pretty regular basis from, um, you know, from rot and wear and, and the like on, on any wooden ship today or otherwise. Yeah. You guys have the same challenges of thought, too, with respect to that, with modifying our ship, you know, all the time. We, we, we have to have the same conversation. How much do you modify? How much can you really keep? Um, fortunately, we have a steel hull, so we're going to be able to keep a lot more, I think, long term. But, but still, it's it's a, it's a common challenge. It's another thread that connects the Constitution mm -hmm. with the Iowa. I did some volunteering on a uh, on a museum ship that not us uh, some number of years ago, and I, they'll remain nameless because I'm about to throw them under the bus. But um, <laughs> we were out there uh, as part of a Navy Reserve unit. They'd given us some space on board, and we were rehabbing that space. And they came to us and said, "You can't paint it." And I'm like, "It needs to be painted out." They said, "No, no, this has original paint." And I looked at him, and I'm like, H "Have you been in the Navy? <laughs> there is no such animal as original paint. Are you serious?" But yeah, they literally wouldn't let us paint the space out because it was original paint. And I thought, "Oh my goodness!" So it is a, it is an interesting thought process and challenge that you have to go through. Uh, I know when uh, when I was on active duty here, we didn't think twice about welding a bracket or moving a pipe or doing something because it was all about keeping the ship functional. And then you turn the page into a museum, and it's like, "Okay, we have to stop here." And that's challenging. Yeah, we, we have those yeah. debates all the time. Our, part of our philosophy has been to uh, retain things that are truly unique aboard the ship. And I can speak to various things. Uh, we only have bathtub. one steering. Yeah, the bathroom is important. <laughs> bathtub. FDR was in it. Don't um, the you know, We only have one steering <laughs> gear room. We, we only, or really two, but you know, we only have one CEC or combat engagement center. And we don't want to change those spaces. But even within those uh, actual concepts, we have some challenges of how far do you go and even in CEC. You know, yeah. what do you do and what can you not do? And then there's some backdating that you talk about as well. And I kind of treat the ship as a big model. You know, I, I, I'm a model builder and, and done some professional work. And I think about that one date and time that you're trying to replicate. <laughs> yeah. Well, and for us, I think finding parts is extremely difficult back to 80 years ago and trying to find something equivalent and retrofitting. I mean, we're going through the power upgrades and things like that now. But finding parts for a ship built. 200 some odd years ago, I can only imagine you have a lot of things that you've had to figure out. All right, what is the modern day equivalent that is is sustainable? Because I mean, we have to shift our for teak wood, for example, shifting to other types of wood where needed, and then parts that retrofit Actually, some I, of the retrofit. I can speak electrical. to that, but I want Carl to speak up on that too because you, you mentioned a couple things to me when I was there about things that you're trying to modify and so forth. Yeah, the the Navy, uh, you know. W w which owns and operates the ship still um, has taken a very set philosophy about that, but but still face those same challenges. 
you know, over 225 years the Constitution's been afloat, there's so much that's been changed of her that, as you're saying, Dave, trying to pinpoint some spot in time, uh, you know, can can really be specious. Um, because there were times in, in, for a long stretch of the time in Constitution's history when, you know, she was completely downrigged and there was a barn built over the entire upper deck of the ship because it could serve as a, you know, as a receiving dormitory, basically, uh, in a shipyard. And I'm pretty sure that was not anything that anybody wanted to like or would think about wanting to duplicate as, <laughs> as, as the ships roll today. Um, and uh, and yet, you know, you're right, Kyle, that there are the the, the gear and equipment isn't necessarily the, the same either. But so then the question is, what is it you're trying to preserve? And for for the Navy, you know, the concept of, of preservation and restoration more significantly than preservation at a ship this age um, is about, I think, presenting a, a specific story. And and so the the Navy has made it sort of a goal on paper, at least, to maintain and restore to the ship to um, its appearance uh, at the beginning of the War of 1812, yeah. um, which is when, you know, was the ship's um, most significant sort of of time period and 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 certainly the the cause of its its great celebrity was its victories over british frigates during that conflict um but you know even there so much has been added on and changed around that that from both uh you know even though the ship is um probably has uh some slightly better budgeting courtesy of the federal government uh you know the the financing and funding of those changes and the public's acceptance of them and agreement within the government of what they're going to do uh, you know, is is a constantly an uh, up and down kind of challenge too, um, and it changes with with history um, as well. Uh, you know, the the current uh, 24 pound guns on board USS Constitution, the 24 pound long guns uh, on the gun deck, um, are uh, duplicates that were constructed in the 1920s as part of a massive restoration that was done at the time. And so while they're non-functioning, um, they are full cast iron guns with all the same heft and weight of the originals, except that they're not accurate uh, at all to that time period because it turns out at the time they were operating under a false historical assumption about where the original guns came from. And so these are substantially larger and imprinted with a royal uh, seal on them because of the belief that that they had the original guns that come from the Royal Navy, and that, which has certainly you know, been determined since not to be the case. But there you go. Um, and so, you know, the cost of replacing those at the moment would be pretty egregious. And so you're kind of stuck with that. Um, and then there's a million other accommodations made to access to the public. Um, yeah. You know, just yesterday uh, I was on board the ship with a group of school teachers and it can be uh, difficult sometimes to uh, help people interpret and understand what the ship did look like when it was actively sailing because so many changes have, have been made over time. Uh, you know, the massive capstan um, that went from the spar deck down to the gun deck on single cylinder and could be operated at both levels, um, you know, is still maintained um, and was recently in fact rebuilt but could not be used at the moment because where all of the bars that would go in to turn are spaces that are now occupied by, um, you know, friendly ladders for visitors coming and going from below deck to above deck. Uh, so there's there's this constant sort of weighing, uh, I think, of decisions you make. And for the Navy, it, it you know, it has been sort of a point of, of difficult decision making. And that actually leads to the genesis of the, the Constitution Museum, where I work, um, you know, prior to the 1970s, uh, for most of the 1900s, Constitution uh, was itself very much a, a museum. Uh, literally, the Navy had been collecting artifacts and they were on display in glass cases scattered around the decks. Uh, and so it wasn't until the lead up to the American Bicentennial in 1976 that the Navy made a conscious decision that they wanted to present and interpret the ship as it would have appeared when it was going underway in battle in, in the beginning of the 1800s. Uh, and so the museum was established, um, you know, to care for all those objects 
and become sort of the keeper of the stories. Uh, and we've been continuing to do that since, uh, you know, with that initial, the initial Navy loans that form the genesis of the collection have now expanded out for us to about 3,000 objects and more than 10,000 nice. documents from throughout the ship's history. But our ability as a separate institution to do that allows the Navy too to then, you know, present this as a much more active ship. But even there, you know, as I tell people all the time, you look up at all this majestic rigging and it's overwhelming to people, but then you stop them and say, hey, there's only a couple sails bent on right now. Uh, and, you know, there were 42 sails with an acre of sailcloth. And, you know, some of these sails could have 20 or 30 lines each controlling them, um, you know, once you got done, all was said and done. And then you imagine all of that additional lines coming down to belaying pins uh, on pin rails and five rails on the deck and and equipment and gear for uh you know for guns to actually uh man them block and take all that would have been stretched across the deck that you don't display today because it would be tripping up tourists yeah, very much um you know all of that kind of stuff really sort of plays into that same philosophy of uh, from a historical ship perspective what's your goal and mission well, what are you trying to achieve so i have a question as a, a little bit of a sailing geek here um how much are you using synthetic rope right now and it had, like with the blocks and all this stuff up in the rig is it pretty original or have you got a lot of modern stuff up there so the the navy it, it, the navy has two sort of branches that uh, maintain and operate uss constitution uh and so there's a, a 70 percent active duty uh crew that is on for about two year stints and some of them many of them actually are right out of boot camp uh, and the rest are fleet returnees who are, you know, mid-career, come here and then move on. Uh, in fact, at the moment, Constitution has its first female commander in its 225-year history, uh, Commander Billy J. Farrell, who, whose career to date was really at the tip of the spear on, on uh, cruisers, uh, bridges, uh, is now uh, in command of Constitution. But in addition to them is the Naval History and Heritage Command Detachment mm -hmm. Boston, mm -hmm. which is this the phenomenal uh, group, a branch of the Navy um, made up of career professional shipwrights and riggers. Uh, and they are uh, all civilians, but they are federal Navy employees and they're there for the long haul um, and you know stay for years and years at a time uh, and they're constantly maintaining the ship around the clock. I say all that as an intro to answering your direct question, Ram, because um, they're, the riggers, uh, you know, are constantly making decisions about about what you put up, how you change it, um, what's that balance between appearance and functionality, what we can do and don't you need. Uh, and they are still currently using some synthetics. The, the sails that are currently available to them were um, built in uh, the 1990s as part of the, the sail operation in the ship's 200th anniversary. Um, and those are a, a synthetic, uh, which you, know, you can be really thankful for because yeah. they're the crew still does bend on uh, one or two of the sails each summer, regardless of what the ship's plans are. And uh, and they'll, you know, they'll furl and and uh, and drop those sails on a regular basis. And the cloth's a lot lighter weight, I oh, think, yeah. than, than oh, some yeah. of the stuff that was going on before. I'm still struck by the parallels of, of the two ships as a museum. I mean, um, you, you say that they the Navy has decided to present this ship in a nominally 1812 configuration, and, and that's that's amazing. One of the, the interesting questions we got when we first received the ship was, well, are you going to convert back to World War II configuration? Because that's the most well-known and most interesting to most people. And it's like, well, sure, bring your $400 million and all the parts, you know, that, that you might need to do that because literally the ship has been changed that much. And so the, the honest interpretation is, well, she is a 1943 vessel that looks like she did in, in 1990 when she was decommissioned. And that's really the decision we've had to make. So, it is, uh, you know, as a, as a 1980s battleship sailor, it is always just mildly offensive to me for people to go, well, she needs to be returned to the World War II configuration because that's when she really mattered. And it's like, uh, we kind of like to think that she mattered when I served on her, too. <laughs> but um, the, the, the other thing that, that struck me was the, um, the replica uh, weapons or guns on Constitution uh, and the story behind that. It is often very difficult to get past lore to real history. 
because once the lore settles in, it settles in. I know yeah. as a young sailor on here, I was taught that the ship moved through the water 16 feet when it fired the 16-inch 50s. Uh, and then I always smile and tell people, then I got out and I got a degree in math and physics. And no, it doesn't. <laughs> so Because it, it just doesn't. It can't. Um, yeah. We actually did the calculation. I did this with uh, another engineer. We figured that at maximum charge and all guns firing at once, which they actually don't do, the ship yeah. would move less than three millimeters. So, yeah. And, and they actually don't fire all at the same time because yeah, of, cause they ripple. Fire. Well, there's, yeah. there's a problem that there's actually a yaw problem yeah. and the, uh, the um, hydraulics have to catch up to, yep. to get you back on target. So it's left gun, right, right gun, gun, center, center gun. gun. And, and, they, and there's a delay in between. Yep. And there's a structural concern too of yep. all three at the same time. But yeah, interesting stuff. And I'm sure there's structural things with firing guns back in the day as well. You know, just fascinating. The, the parallels to me just, just blow me away. Well, yeah, I think fun. that's definitely... Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's definitely true, too, uh, in terms of sort of the structural, you know, details and the loads. I think that's one of the things that, from a technology standpoint, too, that makes Constitution such an interesting beast. Um, there is, uh, you know, there was a very set set of needs uh, in building these ships. And they were designed to meet the needs of a very young Navy that was, um, you know, ambivalently supported by a divided public. Uh, the support for the Naval Armament Act was very tight to split in Congress. They didn't want to pay for this massive standing Navy. Um, and so they needed a hybrid ship that was going to meet sort of the, the speed and scouting functionality that the smaller British frigates had but still be able to kind of stand up for itself uh, if it did get into a fight. But America had neither the, the, you know, the will, the interest or the money to be fielding a, um, you know, a fleet of 74 gun ships of the line like the British were doing. Yeah. And so this sort of unique design uh, that could carry heavier guns and more of them um, in a frigate configuration that was longer and heavier than, you know, most of the known frigates at the time uh, really gave them, you know, gave them an advantage and, and allowed them to meet the new Navy's needs uh, sort of at the time. And that required, you know, some, uh, some technological uh, sort of decision making in terms of materials and design for sure. Yeah, and that went into the, the design of Iowa as well. She was meant to be in a gunfight, you know, really, and that's that's literally to slug it out with another vessel or, as a peer. Yep. And, and that's how she was designed. And she had the same challenges of funding. You know, the design board, the Navy design board for the Iowa uh, really chewed on a ton of things, including money and configuration and armament and how much extra armor and what kind of speed. I mean, it's just it was a difficult decision. And once again, there's that parallel going back 250 years. Well, I've, I've often said uh, the Navy is 250 years of tradition unhampered by progress, but the, uh, the reality of it is that the problems are the same. Technology changes, the enemy changes, the political landscape changes, but the nuts and bolts of, of a fighting Navy really don't. Uh, we're running up against time stops here. Uh, I'm going to uh, mention to the listeners that if you have comments, questions, or you'd like to us to cover another topic, please send an email to podcast at labattleship.com. That's uh, podcast at labattleship.com, as I like to say. And um, French. Yeah, well, yeah. Thanks, Carl. Come back and see us again soon. <laughs> thank, yeah, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. It was so great to talk to you and, yeah. and kind of compare notes on this fun stuff. I, I, we could talk all day. Yeah. Literally, we could. There's Absolutely. No yeah. All right. Closing comments? Nope. None? Love it. I'm right. being heard. I guess no objections. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Without <laughs> objection, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate thank your time. Thank you. Carl, thanks. Thank you. Good for to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.